Uh, so let me just say a couple things about the justice dialogue. Um, the intention of this is to have an ongoing discussion about these issues, issues of justice, issues of economic, social, political, environmental justice. And uh, the goal is to inform us, the occupiers, about these issues so that we can um, be more knowledgeable and informed about what we're doing uh, to affect change society. So let me just read this and then I'll get into it. Uh, we, the Occupy Buffalo movement, have come together to resist the injustice of the corporate domination of our political institutions towards the end of changing these institutions so they are more responsive to our needs. We invite citizens of various levels of education to contribute to and benefit from an ongoing public discourse on the broad subject of justice. We believe that the democratic process that the Occupy movement has adopted carries great moral authority in its openness to all voices, its orientation towards peaceful relations, and its commitment to a pragmatic consensus. However, our democratic process stands in need of knowledge and a vision of our common well-being. This justice dialogue is dedicated to sharing our collective knowledge and developing a shared vision of a better future for all of us. So the topic I have for today is the problem of prerogative in Locke's treatise of government, AKA the need for WikiLeaks. And I want to say that the next talk that we have scheduled is um, in some ways linked to this nexus of literature. Um, the Harvard professor, uh, he's recently passed away in the last decade. Robert Nozick wrote a book called Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which um, was published in 73, I believe, or 74, somewhere around then, which um, is a classic in the literature of libertarianism. So, and he bases his theory uh, in part in John Locke's Second Treatise of Government. So there's something of a connection then between what I'm going to be talking about today and our next topic. So that's sort of a plug for our next topic. OK, so um, the problem of prerogative in Locke's second treatise of government. Um, and this is connected to WikiLeaks. So I'm going to state what his problem of prerogative is. And I'm going to try and um, be very clear and quick about that and then transition to the practical issue of WikiLeaks and these individual whistleblowers who I think are, are important for the consciousness of our movement and for what we want to reform in, in government and society. All right, so John Locke, um, his two treatises of government um, exercised a great deal of influence on um, Thomas Jefferson and some of the language that we see in the Declaration of Independence some people have suggested is a direct uh, borrowing from John Locke's second treatise. Um, Locke, in the first treatise, argues against um, Robert Filmer and his conception of uh, divine right of kings. Filmer had developed in, in his argument the idea that the first king was uh, Adam, uh, of, of Adam and Eve. And that um, subsequent kings got their authority from being a descendant, a descendant of Adam. Now, in the process of arguing against Filmer, John Locke makes the point that when God gave the world um, to Adam, it was not Adam as an individual. It was Adam as the precursor of mankind. And that God meant for mankind to share the world. So Locke's very conception of property and his conception of government is a way of instituting um, a protection. Justice is a, a way of protecting individuals and their collectives, their collectivities. So his argument was that it's not the case that God intended for us to have a monarchy and for one person to have what Locke calls, this exact language he uses, absolute and arbitrary control over lives and property, right? So in its place, he said that we have the power of consent, that, that God made us free. And I want to really emphasize 
God here because I want to lead up to what Locke calls the problem of prerogative. So God, Locke says, gave us freedom, okay? And government should reflect this divine bequest. So instead of the improper interpretation of what God was doing, which is set, Filmer, which was setting up an absolute and arbitrary power, Locke says that we in our freedom can come together and choose to establish government. And the point of government is to achieve justice. And what is justice? Protecting our lives, our liberties, and our property or our estate. And he said those three things, life, liberty, and the state, can be understood as property. And basically, property we can understand as rights, that which we have a right to. We have a right to our bodies. We have a right to our freedom. We have a right to those things that we justly acquire, our estates. OK? So that's the purpose of government. Now, Locke goes on to uh, suggest a structure for government. And the basic structure is that the commonwealth the people decide on a governing um, structure above them. And he said that the center of this government's governing structure um, should be a legislature. Okay, legislature establishes the laws, and then the executive carries out the laws. And then when there are disputes, there should be a judiciary, which could be connected to the legislature or the executive in Locke's scheme. But Locke was uh, clear in talking about these things as powers of government. So you had, in fact, the way Locke used the referred to a legislature is he, he talked about the legislative, which is a little funny in English because he's not referring to a body, he's referring to a power. So there's legislative power, and this is at the center of government. It is what makes the laws. And he says the legislative power can go to a monarchy. You can have a constitutional monarchy. Or it can go to a select group of people, an oligarchy. Or it can go to the people as a whole, a democracy. But the point is that the center of government is an organ, a power, that establishes the laws by a procedure that's agreed upon by the people. OK, so the legislative power is one power. Another power is the executive power, and that's the power that carries out the law. And then a third power Locke identifies is the federative power, which is uh, something that's in between the two, and it makes, it treats the, the commonwealth as a whole, and it represents the whole in the sense of makes treaties and speaks to other powers, right? Okay, now, all of this is a precursor to chapter 14 of the Second Treatise on Government. Chapter 14 is called Of Prerogative. Of Prerogative. What is prerogative? Prerogative is when an officer in the government exercises the power of government outside of what has been strictly delineated by law. Okay? So prerogative is basically I'm in the government, I recognize that the law doesn't cover a specific issue, but I'm going to address that issue because the point of government is to seek the good of the commonwealth and to protect, like I said, the rights of the commonwealth, life, liberty, and state. So Locke's point in discussing prerogative is to get at the spirit of government, which is to seek our ends. But at the end of this discussion, he, he talks about the history of prerogative. He talks about how in early governments, we had kings. And kings, especially if they were popular, were given wide prerogative. And he first starts to suggest that that's an issue, that's a problem. Because you might have a good king that everyone trusts, and you give him a great deal of prerogative. But what if the next king isn't so good? So he says, you know, we ought to, we ought to be a little worried about prerogative, and he says, that in the natural development, the historical de development of governments, prerogative has been reined in, and people have promulgated more laws, so there's less gray areas. Okay, but at the end of this chapter on prerogative, he raises a very fascinating issue, and he says, "Well, what do you do if there are abuses of prerogative?" Now he's already suggested that there may be abuses, but here he head on says, "Well." What do you do? 